we're good to go, right? Hey, hi. Um, can you guys hear me okay? Yes? Okay, all right. So, uh, hey, let's start. Um, hey, thanks for joining me here today. Um, my name is Luis, Luis Martin Garcia, and I am an engineer at Facebook. I work mainly on our open source initiatives around networking, and I also work with our technology partners in the open networking space. So um, today, I would like to talk about the way we see our network at Facebook from the very high level, uh, from the way that the people accesses Facebook, all the way down to the individual components that transmits the bits over the fiber on, on, a, on a data center. So just to put the whole thing into a bit of perspective, Currently, we serve 1.8 billion people, and that's not even counting all our portfolio of apps. So as you can see, we operate at a very, very high scale. Um, at Facebook, our mission is to make the world more open and connected. So at the very high level, we see our network as one of the pieces that allows us to achieve that mission. So there is the, the uh, people, there is the internet, and then there is us, there is Facebook. But, um, but of course, it's not as simple as that. Yes, we have the people and we have the internet, but then on our side, we have the data. All those uh, posts, videos, pictures, likes, comments, etc., uh, that we typically store in a data center. But in order to provide a better user experience, we typically serve our sites from a point that is closer to the users, and that's the POP, the point of presence, where we also cache some of the content. When the content um, is not available at the pub because it's either not cacheable or because the cache is cold, then it gets fetched from the data center. And these two elements, the pub and the data center, are interconnected by a very important network, which is the Facebook backbone. Um, of course, it gets a little bit more complicated. We don't have a single data center or a single pub, but multiple data centers and multiple pubs. And the backbone is a very large network that spans the whole globe. Um, across the entire continents and oceans. The internet is, of course, not uh, a simple network either, but we see it as a collection of different autonomous systems that we peer uh, with on, uh, at the pops. Oh, sorry. Uh, so what, what, what I would like to do today is to focus speci specifically on the data center part, because I think that's the part that is more relevant to OCP Summit. So what I would like to do is to progressively zoom in on that part to see what's there. So let's do that. If we zoom in, we see, first thing we see is that what we call a data center is not a single building, but more a collection of almost identical buildings that are very close to each other in the same geographical region. We have an exit point of the network on, on every building, the edge of the building, and then all the buildings are interconnected together by an aggregation layer. And this aggregation layer, it's also what allows to connect the entire data center to the Facebook backbone. Zooming in a little bit more on, on a building, then that's where we have what we call our fabrics. And these are massive multi-stage cluster topologies that provide very high bandwidth inside uh, a data center building. So when we think about our fabrics, we see them in two different ways. One as a collection of pods, and pods is our unit of deployment, essentially a collection of, of racks and all the necessary networking to provide connectivity between the servers in those racks and also upstream to other pods or other parts that are outside of the, uh, outside of the fabric. We also see the, um, the fabric as being um, multiple different planes that we use for fall isolation and easier management. So what we do is we group the switches on the, on the top part, the, the, uh, the spine layer, and we connect them to the exact same switches in every pod. So this provides a huge amount of redundancy and it allows us to do things like taking an entire pod uh, plane, sorry, offline for upgrades, for example. If we zoom in a little bit more, then we get closer to the device level. Um, in the data center, we have a few different types of devices, but um, on the networking side, the most popular ones are the aggregation switches that we use on the aggregation and spine layer of, the, of, the, of those fabrics, and then the top of the rack switch, which is what connects all the servers in, in the same rack. So when we think about a device, we think about it as the sum of two different components, the hardware and the software. On the hardware side, we have the control plane, the data plane, and the baseboard management. And then on the software side, it's interesting because we don't think about our switches as running a network operating system. 
but more as running an operating system and then some services on top. Because at Facebook, we like to treat our switches as just an, another type of server. It just happens that the services that run on top happen to provide networking functions. <clears throat> If we have a look at the hardware part, we see the device has been a collection of different components. So we have that control plane that I was talking about, which is nothing more than a uh, compute module with some CPU that we can use to uh, run actual software on the device. And then the, uh, the data plane is a forwarding ASIC that can switch the packets directly in hardware. We, of course, have all those extra components that make a hardware device, all the fans, the, the PSUs, the front ports, console and out-of-band management, the BMC chip, et cetera. So what, when we assemble all these components together and integrate them into a board, then we produce things like Wedge 100, which is our 32 by 100 top of the rack switch that we use in production. On the software side, of course, we have the operating system with its kernel and device drivers, but then the services on top, as I was mentioning before, they provide those networking uh, capabilities. So we have agents that can then provide features like VLANs, ACLs, routing protocols, etc. On the baseboard management side, we all also have an operating system running there, but in this case, the services, they provide things like temperature and fan control, power cycling capabilities, and, and, all, uh, and all these type of things. So apart from that, we also have several system tools, libraries, and other agents running consistently across the whole, the whole fleet, not only on networking devices. Um, because for us, operation is something that we put a lot of focus on. We, we sometimes say that we prefer operation over features. So we have a lot of different software components running both inside the devices as well as in uh, other like central points of the infrastructure to do interesting things like automatic deployment, automatic configuration, um, monitoring, alert generation, auto remediation, you know, things like that. So when we do that, when we create these software components, we build software products like FBOS, which is our layer two and layer three stack implementation that we use in Prod or OpenBMC that um, is a complete system that not only we use in the switches, but also in other types of servers. But if we go back to that concept of hardware and the software, and we take the concept and replicate it multiple times, so multiple control planes, multiple data planes, and then all the associated software to control each part, then what we build are things like Backpack, which is basically a, uh, you know, the collection of all those components replicated 12 times to create a chassis switch with 128 ports that can provide 100 gig in our data center. If you remember when I was talking about the fabric, I was talking about these class topologies, right? Um, well, if we forget about the racks for a second, guess how we've designed uh, backpack internally? Exactly uh, like that, as a class topology, what we call a class in a box. So basically, 12 different forwarding ASICs that uh, are interconnected to each other in this topology and that speak standard Ethernet to each other and has an, OCS, an associated compute unit to program uh, each of those. So basically this allows us to treat one chassis switch exactly the same way as we would operate a collection of 12 different independent devices that we would assemble in this type of topology, which is something that we already had a lot of experience doing at Facebook. So it makes it very easy for us. If we go back to the concept of the components, and instead of replicating all of them, what we, add is to, what we do is to add them, so for example, adding an optical coherent modem and the relevant optical front ports, um, then we can build things like Voyager, which is our open optical transponder. If instead of adding things, what we do is to replace them, then we can have uh, variations of our devices. Like, for example, if we go for the ASICs, we can have things like Wedge 100B um, that um, Barefoot created to integrate their Tofino ASIC, or Wedge 100C that was created by Cavium to integrate their Explion ASIC. We could all do other things, like, for example, upgrade the compute unit for something that provides more performance or more features, which is exactly what we did for the Watch 100S project that uh, my colleague Xu Wang is going to be talking about tomorrow in one of the workshops. So the beauty of open hardware is that it allows us to do this type of thing, to just take components, add them, replace them to build new different types of devices in a way uh, that let us tackle new different use cases and also allows us to do that 
leveraging existing designs that we have already validated at very high scale. So we don't have to reinvent, reinvent the wheel for, um, every time or start from scratch every time we need to do something different. Um, the community, of course, can take this very powerful idea and come up with other stuff like, I don't know, uh, off-chip processing to hold the entire routing table on a single device or use chips that not only provide 3.2 tera but provide double uh, density or four times that density. So uh, we have a lot of different possibilities here for the community to play with. Another great thing about um, open hardware is that there are no restrictions on the software that you can run on it. At Facebook, we run FBOS and OpenBMC in production in all, all our um, OCP devices. But um, if another company wants to take those very exact same devices and run something else, they can run different operating systems and they can run different layer two and layer three stacks. So on exactly the same gear, right? So this opens a lot of different possibilities, like for example, running things like Cumulus Linux from Cumulus Networks or FlexSwitch by uh, SnapRoute or operating systems like Open Networking Linux by Barefoot or um, Ubuntu by Canonical, for example. A very interesting combination that was just announced today is the ability to run Psy and Sonic on top of the WET40 and the WET100 platforms. Um, I'm pretty sure you all guys are, know, are, are familiar with the tech, but Psy is an abstraction layer that makes it very easy to implement networking functions in software um, um, in a way that is independent from the underlying ASIC on the device. And then Sonic is Microsoft's software for open networking in the cloud. So I'm mentioning this because this was the result of a recent collaboration between Microsoft, Canonical, and ourselves. And hey, from here, I would like to personally thank Microsoft and Canonical for the great work uh, in making this a, a reality today. So to be honest, at Facebook, we love open hardware. And on the networking side, we've been building devices for, for a few years now, and even for longer, when we talk about our other compute and storage uh, devices. And, and we are constantly working on new ideas and new things that we can share with the community. So just to su sum up, when we look at our network, we, we look at that from multiple different angles, from those big blocks that I was describing at the beginning, the data center, the backbone, and the pops, all the way down to the specific components that transmit the bits over the fiber. But regardless of what level we look at, we have one thing that always stays the same, and it's our approach to take very simple and consistent components and reuse and replicate them over and over to build a network at the scale that we want. Um, at, uh, we always try to do this you know, in the, in the most efficient way, and we try to achieve the least amount of human intervention, intervention in order to operate at such a high scale. Um, at Facebook, we also believe on hardware and software disaggregation. So we believe that the ability to evolve those two things independently allows for more innovation and makes the whole industry to move faster. Um, but as we like to say, this journey is only 1% finished. Um, OCP and the open networking community in general have, has made huge amount of progress in the industry already, huge. But we still see many other places in the network, not only on the data center, that we can disrupt uh, and open and disaggregate. So uh, we're looking forward to working to, with the community to see all very new and exciting things in this direction. Uh, thank you very much, and hope you guys enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you.